this episode of Hooked on Hatcheries, we fly to northwestern Ontario and visit the Thunder Bay Salmon Association's Community Fish Hatchery. The city of Thunder Bay is located on the north shore of Lake Superior. Lake Superior is one of the largest bodies of fresh water in the world, containing more water than all Great Lakes combined. Just outside of Thunder Bay on the Kaministiqua River, or Cam River, is Kekebeka Falls Provincial Park. The 40 meter high Kekebeka Falls is the second highest waterfall in Ontario with year-round access for viewing. Each spring, endangered lake sturgeon travel 47 kilometers upstream to spawn near the base of the falls. Downstream of Kekebeka Falls, on the banks of the Cam River, is the Thunder Bay Salmon Association Hatchery. The association was founded in 1987 by a group of sportsmen interested in establishing a viable Chinook salmon sport fishing industry. Every October they collect, fertilize and hatch Chinook salmon eggs and raise the salmon to fingerling size to be released into the Cam River by volunteers in June. Since the late 1980s, the Thunder Bay Salmon Association has stocked over 4 million Chinook salmon into the Cam River. The following video outlines portions of the husbandry of fish during early and advanced rearing best management practice. The steps outlined in this video have been taken from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry Fish Culture Technical Bulletin and serves as only a guide to fish culturists for fish husbandry during advanced rearing. This video has been made courtesy of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry Community Hatchery Program. For more information on the Community Hatchery Program, please visit www.communityhatcheries.com. For more detail on this topic, we encourage you to review Section 2.1 of the Community Hatchery Fish Culture Guide. This document is a valuable resource for all community hatchery volunteers by providing technical information, best management practices, as well as a tool for knowledge transfer among hatchery volunteers. The guide is organized into chapters that support the full life cycle of hatchery operations from spawning to incubation to fish husbandry, health management, transportation and stocking. To download the Community Hatchery Fish Culture Guide, visit the resources section of our webpage at www.communityhatcheries.com resources. The definitions of early and advanced rearing are based on the developmental stages of the fish, but are often confused due to the use of these names for specific areas of the fish hatchery. Early rearing is defined as the phase of development following hatching which the fry feed from the yolk sac and includes a transition to external feed. Advanced rearing is defined as the phase following the switch from the yolk sac to external feed phase, after swim up and first feeding. Fish at all stages of development tend to have similar needs in regards to environmental and physical conditions, so the blurring of these definitions does not have a great effect on the overall care of the fish in the fish culture station. In advanced rearing stages, a routine of care involving the following areas of concern will maximize growth and health of the fish stocks in the hatchery. This will not only minimize stress to the fish, but it will ensure that all issues surrounding the care of the fish and the facilities are attended to. A routine will also help in the maintenance of proper records, which is crucial for effective management of a hatchery. It is important to create a checklist for the facility that includes lighting controls, water temperature records, oxygen monitoring systems, feeding equipment, screens and sandpipes, water source and outflow structures, water filters, alarm systems and other security features, water flow to rearing units, and monitor effluent water. Observing the fish at the time of feeding is important as it can be determined whether the fish are being under or overfed. Overfeeding can cause water quality problems, whereas underfeeding can lead to emaciation, fin nipping, eye picking, and cannibalism. 95% of the feed should be eaten in the first 1 to 2 minutes. Fingerlings and older fish reared in water temperatures below 5 degrees Celsius may not require regular feeding. Once daily feedings are adequate and a lack of food for several days at a time will not harm fish at these low temperatures. Feeding frequency and amount must be modified for individual conditions. However, a general rule is that smaller particle sizes are desirable for more frequent feedings and larger pellets for less frequent feedings. Please refer to Table 1 of Section 2.1 of the Community Hatchery Fish Culture Guide for general guidelines to follow for the feeding of fish of various sizes. Check water levels in all units. Water flows should be checked on a regular schedule and records should be properly maintained of all flow levels and adjustments made. In raceways, the exchange of water should be one to three times per hour. 
while hatching troughs should have higher exchanges two to three times per hour. Check the water temperature. Water temperature should be recorded on a daily basis. Recording thermometers are ideal because they can provide a continuous record of water temperature. Ideal temperatures vary with species reared. For all salmon species, the temperature should be increased for the initial feeding and then returned to a regulated level. Please refer to the Community Hatchery Fish Culture Guide for optimum water temperatures for the culture of various fish species. Check dissolved oxygen concentrations. Measurements should be regularly taken from the same location at the same time of day so that they can be accurately compared. Observe water clarity to determine if overfeeding or silt is causing debris buildup. Please refer to the Community Hatchery Fish Culture Guide for diverse water parameters and their suggested optimum ranges for salmonid aquaculture. Observe the condition and behavior of the fish. Record any abnormal behavior such as swimming to the surface, crowding at the inflow or outflow, flashing or spiraling, etc. Abnormal behavior may be a sign of water quality problems, onset of fish diseases, or predator problems. Remove, count, and record all mortalities. Daily mortalities are normal. However, they should decline to low levels as fish age, with mortalities in broodstock being very rare. Remove the dead fish with nets or scoops, which should be disinfected before being used again. Each tank should have its own equipment in order to avoid spreading disease. Mortalities should be checked for any sign of disease or other abnormalities and disposed of accordingly. Tank crowding can cause unnecessary stress to the fish. A density of 30 kilograms of fish per meter cubed is a good conservative rule of thumb. Higher densities may be supported depending on the water quality, other environmental factors, rearing practices, and species of fish. Cleaning rearing units can be very labor intensive and stressful to the fish. However, regular cleaning is essential in units that are not self-cleaning. Methods of cleaning vary with the type of unit and the size of the fish. When fish are at the fry and fingerling stage, units should be cleaned regularly at least once per day. As the fish grow and rearing density increases, the fish will tend to move the waste along the unit and cleaning can be done less frequently. There are several methods of cleaning the rearing unit. Vacuums and siphons can be used without lowering the water level. Brushing with a feather or soft bristle brush requires the lowering of the water level and can be stressful to fish. Some precautions must be taken to reduce the risk of mortalities when cleaning this way. Direct the waste to the outflow of the tank. Avoid lowering the water too rapidly or too much because this will increase the stress to the fish. If the water becomes too low before the cleaning is complete, allow it to refill and finish cleaning later. Avoid too vigorous brushing. This will stress the fish and break up solids making them more difficult to remove. Be sure to replace the sandpipe or switch the control valves back to the regular effluent line. Each unit should have its own cleaning equipment to avoid transfer of diseases. If this is not possible, at least each lot should have its own equipment. Sections of the rearing units that are not submerged, such as the outside and tops of the sides, should also be regularly cleaned. Most fish are sensitive to bright light and will seek shelter. Light should be switched on gradually over indoor units. Incandescent light is preferred. Fish will crowd in the shadows of the corners of the units if light is not properly controlled. Crowding will cause an increase in mortality and reduction in growth. Cover should be provided for all fish raised outdoors. This will provide some protection from bright sunlight as well as from predators and will reduce the stress caused by human activity around the units. The Community Hatchery Program is a partnership between the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. For more information, visit our webpage at www.communityhatcheries.com.